Welcome back. I hope that your breakout session was as interesting as mine, but I, what I heard during the coffee break, that seems to be the case, that the breakout sessions were really instructive to convene in a smaller, a little bit more focused groups uh, so that in order to further the discussion. And uh, tomorrow, the breakout sessions will convene again, as you know. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce you for the, to the first uh, high order beat talk of today. Uh, the second one will be in the afternoon with Joe Ito. And the, the first one today is um, Carlo Fabricatore. Carlo Fabricatore um, is a CEO of Initium Studium in, uh, Studios in the UK and also a lecturer at the University of Worcester. And he's going to talk about the, the individual and social evolution through digital gaming out of the box. Thank you, Carlo. All right, um, good morning. Uh, we're gonna talk about games, learning, and development, and eventually evolution. So why talking about games at all? Well, uh, let me start by, you know, let me, let me start with a little bit of daydreaming about learning and development. Wouldn't it be great if ordinary people could learn the nature and mechanics of ecosystems and use this knowledge and understanding in order to preserve their balance and facilitate their development. And wouldn't it be great if ordinary people could learn the nature and mechanics of politics, uh, economics and culture and act consequently in order to build and nurture healthy social systems. And wouldn't it be great if ordinary people could learn and understand the impact of religious beliefs and moral frames of reference on civil societies and act consequently in order to guide and support collectivities facing the quandary of good versus evil? And wouldn't it be great if ordinary people could understand the nature and mechanics of epochal phenomena such as organized crime, warfare, and even terrorism, and act consequently in order to build a better future for collectivities. Wouldn't it be great if all this could happen, not because of individuals, but because of people interacting with peers, negotiating means, and building knowledge and understanding in collective efforts, transcending geopolitical boundaries. And wouldn't it be great if all this could happen, not because of obligation, but because people would intrinsically be motivated by the challenges that they would face. And wouldn't it be great if all this could happen, and more than this could happen at any age and any time? Well, if you do think that all this would be great indeed, as I do, I have good news for you. All this is possible. And even more than that, all this is happening right now as we speak. All this through digital gaming. And it is important because of the pervasiveness of digital gaming. Bear in mind that approximately one third of the world's population plays video games, regardless of age and gender. Then why is this kind of magic happening and how does it actually happen? Well, let's focus on games, gamers, and play communities to understand this phenomenon a bit more. So what is a game? Well, a game is a system that comprises players and artifacts, so toys. And within the system, players interact with each other and with the game artifacts according to rules in the pursuit of game goals. So this uh, leads to a dialogic player game in, in relationships, and this defines what we call the gaming or play experience. The play experience is not granted. In fact, there are conditions that are required to trigger it and to sustain it. First of all, players need to think that a given system is a game. So there is an issue of acceptance, which can be social acceptance. For instance, we all think that Monopoly is a game because it's a cultural thing, World of Warcraft likewise, and so on and so forth. But there is also a matter of individual acceptance. For some of us, there are things that are games, and we leave them as if they were games, and those very same things for others are serious, even tragically serious. 
Think about finance, think about warfare, think about politics. Then another important condition is that the game must be a good game. It can be a poor game, and if it, that is the case, players won't engage in order to be a good game. A game has to provide meaningful and fair challenges and rewards. It has to provide meaningful and entailing context. And then it has to allow the development of a sense of mastery in the player. Another important thing is that as long as it lasts, the play experience is the most important thing to players. Hence, the game has to have the ability of sustaining the acceptance and the motivation in order for the play experience to last as long as possible. Players very seldom engage in complex games alone. By nature, they are associative beings, and in fact, they do associate in play communities. And within these play communities, they build preferences, beliefs, meanings, and knowledge within and outside the game system. Hence, the two models that you see depicted here. On the left hand, you can see how everything starts from the game system, which is actually only a part of what we call play space, because as we said, players do interact even outside the game. And the play space as, uh, itself is just a part of the real world. So continuity here, no fragmentation. It's the same world and it has different layers and all these maps to a similar model for the social space. At first you have individuals as players and then you have association of players leading to play community and then you have to bear in mind that play communities are a part, an important part of our civil society. This is very important to understand learning, game-based learning actually, and development. So what about learning and development? Well, Playing requires a huge amount of learning, very comprehensive learning. It has to be experience-based, it has to be transdisciplinary, it has to be conceptual in that it requires players to deal with concepts and relationships amongst concepts in order to solve problems. It has to be epistemic in that it requires players to deal with the origin of knowledge, with the essence of knowledge, and with the boundaries of knowledge because they have to deal with ill-structured problems. It has to be social because as we said, it requires players to interact with peers in order to achieve and pursue and achieve, hopefully, um, commonly shared goals. It has to be operational when the outcome are assumptions that can drive actions and can be validated through the outcomes of action. It is communicational when players interact to build consensus and when uh, what we call best judgment comes out of this consensus. It is effective when players gain that I don't know what. They realize that there is something that enriches them but they couldn't possibly verbalize. So very comprehensive uh, learning going on in games. Even more than that, learning is made meaningful and intrinsically motivating by the game context. This is why games are natural learning environments. Game-based learning is free and open. There are no power knowledge networks that constrain or try to direct or even hinder learning within games. And frames of references are easily built, destroyed, and even transformed in the game space. Last but not least, these learning acting cycles that happen within the game lead to development of players as individuals and as communities. So the development that stems from games is not constrained within the boundaries of the play space. It can actually propagate from the game space to the rest of the real world. And this can happen because of typical knowledge transfer processes based on contextual analogies. We see something in the game and we see something in the real life that looks pretty much like what we've experienced in the game. Hence, we apply knowledge. But there is also the issue of real life, serious life being 
not too serious or not so serious to some. That facilitates knowledge transfer even more. Hence, the models that you see here, on the left hand, you see how propagation happens in the real world space. Development starts within the game system and it expands. It makes the game system evolve. Then eventually, it propagates to the play space, which in turn expands, evolves. And all this finally propagates to the real world and hopefully that'll make the real world expand and get better. This maps to a similar social space where the expansion, the first level of expansion is what the player is involved in, then that propagates to the whole play community and finally to the civil society. All this holds for games in general. So what about video games? What makes them so special? What is the added value of digitality? Well, normal games, regular games, are constrained by the boundaries of the physical world, whereas video games are not. They allow transcending boundaries. So video games allow transcending geopolitical barriers, uniting people. They allow accessing contexts and systems which would be otherwise out of reach and that because of simulation. And they allow achieving meaningful contextual learning well beyond the time-space boundaries created by the society and by traditional schooling contexts. So, um, hey, games are great. Actually, they are fantastic. Well, hang on. It glitters, but it's not all gold. In fact, development doesn't necessarily mean evolution. And through games, you can actually get polar outcomes. And let me be brutally frank. Through games, you can learn how to help your brothers as much as how to kill them. And even when the learning and the development within the game is positive, there is still the link that needs to be made in order to transfer those positive outcomes to reality. And making that link is not always trivial. Sometimes you need a little help as a player to realize that. So, some work is required. Work is required in order to create game systems capable of generating positive, socially relevant development for players, enhance play societies, enhance real world societies. And work is required in order to support the propagation of development from the game to the real world. All this could be summarized with the aim of creating game-based education models and related practices. And who would be the perfect agent for this kind of work? Could it be universities? Could universities through research generate these kind of models? exploiting all the incredible learning that is happening right now as we speak? Could university be the agent and through action facilitate and support game-based evolution? And what would it take for them to be that? I leave these questions as a matter of reflection with two interesting views of equally interesting gentlemen about the importance of play. Thank you very much. There is time for one question as usually is the case with the high order bit talk. Anybody wants to pose a question to Carlo Fabricatore? Okay, if not, thanks again. Now I am